seen. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. 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 This is how we this is how we overcome. This is how we overcome. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. Sorrow into this is how we overcome. This is how we overcome. There is love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again. Victorious faithfulness none can deny through the storm and through the fire there is truth that sets me free Jesus Christ who lives in me you are stronger you are stronger Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of all. No beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to see and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. You are stronger, you are stronger. Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. So let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. Let your name be lifted higher, be lifted higher, be lifted higher. You are stronger, you are stronger. Sin is broken, you have saved me. It is written, Christ is risen. Jesus, you are Lord of
ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words in Jesus, Redeemer, or mighty to save, you are the love song we'll sing forever, bowing before you, blessing your name. rise and thunders roar, I will 
God is a consuming fire, burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the holy righteous judge, ruling over us with kindness and wisdom, and we will keep our eyes. This is our God, a sacred refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable. This is our God, a sacred refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable.
Good morning and welcome everyone. CPR, Care, Play, Read is right around the corner. We're looking forward to another great summer of volunteer help along with plenty of support staff. However, we need you to fill out the volunteer sign up forms via the email sent out by Kate Hughes. You may visit the information desk for more details. One of the big joys of our CPR program is how we already have tons of kids who like to come to VBS, as do all of our own members. Jonah is coming, but Jonah may turn tail and hide, as he likes to do, if we can't get enough folks to help with classes and other stuff planned for this year's show. So please consider helping in any way you can. Sign up forms are still in the Family Center. Hey everybody, I just wanted to come on here and ask for your help with volunteering for CPR this summer. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's a six week program where we get to have kids from all over Garland in our building and we get to work with them over learning their Bible, they get to work on their reading skills, we get to feed them every day. It's an awesome, awesome, awesome opportunity where we get to really be in our community and work with the kiddos who are near us and who are now part of the foster closet and we just get to reach so many kids and it's an awesome opportunity. But we need your help to do it. We are finally back up to pre-COVID numbers, which is awesome. I know that's a big sigh of relief for everybody, but we need numbers to do that. If you can teach a Bible class even just one day out of our whole six weeks, that would be awesome. If you can work a center even just one day of our whole six weeks, that would be fantastic. We just need the congregation to really show up and support this program that we've had for over 30 years here at Saturn Road. Thank you so much for your love for this program. Keep praying over it and keep praying for the sweet kids who are a part of it. Um, there are information, there are things to fill out on the information desk. We start on June 12th and we go through the middle of July. Please let me know if you have any questions. We'd love you to be a part of it. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Good morning, church. So, uh, if you guys don't know who I am, I'm Eli Swaim. I'm the new youth minister for, for y'all, and I'm very blessed to be here. And when they asked me to come up, I was like, oh, yeah, like I'd totally do that just so I can introduce myself. So, hi, I'm Eli. So, I have some announcements for y'all this morning. We are so grateful that we get to have families who've just placed membership. So, let me read them for you. David and Karen Moore. David and Karen, if you're here this morning, would you please raise your hand so we can just thank y'all. There they are in the back there. Thank y'all so much. We love y'all. And then we have another family who just placed membership. Joe, Miranda, Logan, and Madeline Thompson. Are, if, you guys are, if you guys are here, please raise your hand. Right over here. Thank y'all. We're so blessed that y'all are part of this family. And so um, I, Pam Wood has come this morning, and I have something to read for prayers for her husband, Jim Wood. I come to specifically ask for prayers of healing for my husband's heart to start working as it should, and it calms down for a better recovery. He's still in ICU, sedated and on vent. I also ask for you to pray for our family as we go through the unknown of God's plan in this and continue to be faithful to whatever that plan is. So guys, please be praying for them at this moment. Um, if you guys need any more information, come see me or you know, see somebody in the back. But guys, so glad y'all are here, so blessed that we just get to come apart and, and just worship and, and, and love our Lord. So thank y'all.
morning, church family. Shame on you, Eli, for leaving it that high up for me. I say good morning. Um, I'm going to call an audible and share with you uh, my morning so far, which is not what I expected it to be. Brittany and I were uh, leaving the house in separate cars because we had a lot going on this morning. Uh, I was going to pick up donuts for the youth group. You're welcome, by the way. Uh, and on our way there, I look back in my rearview mirror and see Brittany's hazard lights on. She's fine, uh, but she's not here for a reason this morning. She is waiting on roadside assistance with a flat. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so I, I quickly grab the girls, throw them in the car with me, go in to pick up 10 dozen donuts and Dunkin' Donuts with two 
uh, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, which was quite the adventure, with a bad attitude. And then uh, we get here, and there's we're not having class the way we normally do for the teens this morning. Um, and there was a lot to do for that. And then the girls wanted this, the girls wanted that. And I felt like I was running in a million different directions. Um, thank you, Courtney Pine, for holding one of my children this morning. And thank you for keeping your eye on my other one as well. It's very interesting because I think this describes so many of us when it comes to Sunday mornings and just in general, we, we're moving in a thousand different directions. We're thinking about a million different things and when it comes time for communion, you blink and you miss it. And you've missed one of the most powerful things we do all week long. And so shame on me this morning for almost missing it. And I'm gonna call us this morning to slow down and pause. I remember the very first time I took communion. I was in Jackson, Tennessee. I was in the fifth grade. I had been baptized that morning. And I remember that Sunday night, they said, anyone who did not get a chance to partake, it's been prepared in a room in the back. And I remember standing up with so much pride. And going back to that, that room with my grandparents and my parents, and savoring every second of that moment. But when was the last time we did that? When was the last time that you paused and savored every second, remembering the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? Because to be frank, I think most of us fall into the category that I find myself in this morning. Distracted, distraught, focusing on what lies next. Slow down. Slow down with me for just a minute this morning. For each section, I want to share with you just one verse. This is John 6, 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, beyond that, we thank you so much for the body of your Son that takes away the sins of this world. God, I pray that we would wipe away every distraction this morning, that we would forget about the hurdles that lay ahead and focus on this step right here, remembering the sacrifice that was made for us to save us from our sins. We pray this in your name. Amen.
despite wherever you find yourself this morning, I want to share this, this th little three-letter word that will save us despite where you might be mentally, physically this morning. This little word, but. Isaiah 53, verse 5. So despite everything that was shared this morning, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Let's pray over the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you yet again for the sacrifice of your son, for the blood that takes away the sins of this world. God, without it, we don't stand a chance. But praise you that we have it. I don't know what I would do without it. I pray that we don't take this moment lightly, but that we would really feel the weight of the sacrifice of your son. We pray this in your name. Amen. So as I shared earlier, I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old, which is, uh, this is crazy. <laughs> there are lots of times where uh, one of my children will say, I love you, and then hit, <laughs> either to me or to Brittany or to each other, which is funny when it's a kid, but it's not so funny when it's an adult who says one thing and does another. We share uh, James... 2, 14 through 26, before we pray over the giving. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? 
If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by, by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son uh, Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by faith, or excuse me, by works, and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray over the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done. But God, our words are not enough. God, I pray that we would offer back to you, not just a portion of our money, but God, everything we have. Our time, our energies, our thoughts, our efforts, our work, our families, our home, our cars. God, whatever it may be, may we be open-handed. May we hold on loosely and not realize that these things that are not ours, but that we realize that they all belong to you anyways. May what we offer back be blessed. May we do it with a cheerful heart. I pray this in your name. Amen.
Kids, two years ago for Children's Church. I thought somebody was gone. That's okay. There's next time. All right, so Children's Church. First of all, if you are a visitor, we are so glad that you're here with us this morning. Just a couple things before we uh, get to the Children's Church. If you're a visitor and you're looking for more information, first of all, ask people around you who would love to talk to you about it. But there's also a wellness center out these doors to the left. But during this next song, if you are a child between the ages of three and kindergarten, you'll be dismissed to Children's Church and then there out these doors to the right. If you are a visitor and you have a child within that year, please have them join us. We would love that. Classes. After the worship service is over, there's a list of classes on the screen. Please join us. If there's a class that piques your interest, just go ahead and go over there. There's no solution. Just join it. Uh, if you're not sure where these rooms are, again, the welcome center on the left and right outside these doors. People will point you there. This will also be on the screen after the rest of this is over. All right, let's stand together. We're going to read Zechariah chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. In our class on Sunday mornings, uh, for the past couple of months, we've been studying the minor prophets. Uh, those are books we don't read all that often. If you haven't done that in a long time, then refresh your memory, because there's a lot of wonderful promises in there from the Lord. But listen to these words from Zachariah. 
Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, kids. Good morning. If you are joining us uh, from online, and when I say online, I know that it might be on the road, it might be at your residence, but also it might be at a nursing home. And, and so I want to uh, take a cue from Kevin and just to pause and drink slowly and recognize that we have in our presence saints who cannot be here and we want to recognize you guys as we join spiritually for worship. Welcome to those who are in the audience and I am uh, especially uh, happy and privileged to see Bailey this morning. Um, that's my really good. No one really knows what they are doing. Um, we don't. And so, whenever we come into this space where we do our rites of worship, I want us to try to listen for God, you know? Because we don't know what we're doing. We are organizing and we are always putting things together and we have structure, but at the end of the day, we, we are just waiting for God to show up. And before I continue further, I want to, I want to acknowledge you know, our human condition. Um, some of you all are doing great because it's been a great week, a great few months, and that's okay. Um, these are blessings from God, but also some of us have not had great weeks and great days, and it will be okay as well because God holds and blesses all of us. And so I don't have a word for you this morning. I know who does. And if you can hang on long enough with me, then you will find a word that addresses not only you but myself. I've really had a hard time with this worship series because every time I'm preparing a lesson and reading, it's like, man, I don't want to go deeper. I mean, I want to go deeper, but I, I, I find my flesh saying, you know, I, man, I don't know about this because I, I have to change and I have to drink this stuff and imbibe this stuff and figure out how it looks in my day to day. And so sometimes preachers get up and they wax eloquently and all that stuff. Or not so eloquent. But we don't know what we're doing. And we don't have all things figured out. And so I want to just put that out there. Let's pray for each other. Let's, let's walk with each other. Let's, let's support each other. Because really and truly, we follow a God who does not think like us. Who is all powerful. And we should not be trying to keep up. As Kevin said, we should drink slowly. We should rest as he guides. So this morning, I want to take us to this juncture where we'll be discussing justice and worship. Now what I would like you to do is, um, if you have a pen and paper or pencil or whatever, write down the first thing that comes to mind when you see this topic, the justice of worship. And I think midway through the sermon, I think whatever you are going to write down might just be challenged for the good justice is a dirty word because every time it comes up people have ideas and definitions that are not biblical yeah 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 <laughs> yes yes i heard you preach and so yes okay okay <laughs> whose baby is this i love the baby all right well, not the baby, but this baby, because, yeah, yeah. The justice of worship. I got some bookends for you before we begin. And so, if you have books on a shelf, you might have bookends, things that hold them together. And you might organize your books by um, just randomness or maybe by a theme. And so this sermon has bookends that I want to establish before we actually get into the sermon. There's something in the beginning and something well closer to the end. One in Genesis and one in James. And so let's get to the bookends before we get to our sermon. In Genesis chapter number 8, we have these words. 
that comes in the heels of Genesis 4 and verse 10 where it says Abel's blood. By the way, do you remember Abel? Cain killed his brother. Anybody? Everybody? Yes? Thank you. So his brother's blood is crying out for justice, for vengeance. And in Genesis 8, we stumble across this idea. Uh, verse 5 says, And for your life blood, life blood of man, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal. So anybody, any animal that kills a man. You get that? All right. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. I don't know why. Verse 6 says, Whoever sheds human blood, by human shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. So God requires justice from any animal or any human being that sheds blood because human beings bear the image of God. So a violent, unprovoked attack by an animal or a human is not just attacking the person, but the image of God that the person is made in. All right? And we see this point again in James, James chapter 3. James says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. So here's your bookend for the sermon, your bookends. Justice shows us that whether you kill or you curse or do anything in between towards the image of God, God is going to require an answer. Well, that's fascinating. As we get to the book of Micah, Micah chapter 6, verse 1 to 8. Usually we start from verse 6, but we're going to start from verse 1 because it informs verse 6. This is a covenant lawsuit. We have a plaintiff. Any lawyers in the house? We have a plaintiff and a defendant. So the plaintiff would be God, right? Who brings a case. And we'll see those words in the text. And the defendant, Israel, but also Judah as well. So at this point, the kingdom is divided. So you have Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And they have relative stability. The Syrians have backed off. Egypt is nowhere really in the mix. And so they have time to be stable, to grow, to, to, um, to amass wealth. And now they are messing with the weights and they are cheating people and all those things. And so this is the case, the covenant lawsuit that God says, I have uphold, up, upheld my end of the bargain, but you have not. And so stand to your feet as we have a reading of God's word. Micah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Stand up, plead my case before the mountains. Answer me.
Amen to the reading of God's word. Please be seated. God invites the witnesses. Court has, or court rather, is in session. And God calls on the, the mountains and the terrains to provide witness to what has transpired between the covenant parties, Israel and God. He's not calling flaky witnesses to corroborate mess and half truths. He is calling on the established terrain filled with grandeur that's not going anywhere bigger than man intimidating he's saying these are my witnesses they have seen and they bear testimony to what has been our relationship what has been my providence he says they saw when I went down to Egypt's land they saw when you had no power and I could have just looked at you and said, well, that's none of my business. I'm going to leave you to wallow in the mire of slavery and destitution. None of my business. But I came to you and I gave you justice. I gave you fairness because human beings are made in the image of God. Gave you deliverance. I gave you Moses. I gave you Aaron. I gave you Miriam. I gave you these siblings so that they could lead and guide you all the way from Shittim to Gilgal. If you remember, there's a crossing of the Red Sea, and Moses is the champion of the Israelites. But then at Moses' death, we have Joshua taking over at Shittim. Just before they get into the crossing of what? the Jordan River. And so from Gilgal, it marks their entry into the promised land and that journey. And he says, I have been with you by miracle, by might, and I have justified you. So in response, the plaintiff makes his case clear. And in response, the people who have arrived you know, they're doing good now. They are going to speak up. In response, they have this brand new attitude. They ask, well, you know, um, Lord, you've made this case against us, right? Uh, what is our obligation? Um, what, with what shall I come before the law? And that I there is not just for, for an individual, but for the community of Israel, okay? With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? What do I need to do? Implying that there is a parameter. There's a, a list of things to do. There's an end that when I reach, I satisfy your requirements. So tell me, tell me, what, what, what do I owe you? What is my obligation in this covenant thing that you are bringing forth towards us? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil, olive oil that is, good oil, not Crisco? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? How many cows? Lord, there, I mean, there's got to be an end. How many rams? How many burnt offerings? How many of my kids? I have two, I'll give one, okay? How many barrels of oil? I'm not saying about me, I'm saying, I'm just. <laughs> what is the parameter? What are the limits? This is a covenant relationship. God who holds no boundary for blessing is asking the people to do as he does. And they follow up with, uh, no, 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 no. There's got to be an end to this. There's got to be an end. 
I just want to know what I need to do so that I can escape the obligation of being tied to you every single day. And you've seen that before. You've seen that before. If you jump to, say, uh, Matthew 18, Peter came, comes to Jesus, and he asked, Lord, um, you know, I want to I be a forgiving guy, you know. Well, how many times? Four, you know, five, seven. That, that, that's a good biblical perfect number, right? So seven, I just want to know when this thing ends. Because if I reach my seventh, I can tell my neighbor, well, hey, sorry. I ain't, you know, seven. <laughs> that's it. The Lord said 70 times seven. Not to say, well, do the multiplication and get that number. It just means it keeps on going. You've seen this. There was a guy called the rich young ruler. Not sure of his name, but you encounter him in Mark chapter 10. And as he was setting out on a journey, Jesus, you know, a man ran up to him and knelt before him. This is a very good posture for Jesus. I'm recognizing you, Lord and Master. He's kneeling. You ask him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And you know where that story ends. He walks away disappointed. You know why? Because he didn't get boundaries. Because he didn't get a list. Because he heard, I want everything. And he was not willing to give everything. And so, in the context of social justice, finally Lou Hammer says, never to forget where we came from and always praise the bridges that carried us over. Now, I know she's speaking in a different context, but what she's really saying, tied to this text, is when your memory is disconnected from your revival, you get complacent. I get complacent and selfish and prone to vain worship. You forget God's faithful love has brought you and not your works. And so, this idea of justice is a theme. This idea of justice is spoken of in Timothy Keller's book, Counterfeit Gods. And he speaks of an example in the person of Beatrice Webb. Beatrice Webb was a sociologist, economist, labor historian, and social reformer who planted the seeds of what we know now as a welfare state. And in her mind, all we needed to do was to make sure that the system is set up right and fair and just, right? You, you build the machinery, and then it will trickle down and take care of things in society. But then, 30-some years after she had that thought, she writes in a diary. Some in my diary, 1890-ish, I wrote, I have staked all on the essential goodness of human nature. Now, 35 years later, I realize how permanent are the evil impulses and instincts in man. How little you can count on Changing some of these, for instance, the appeal of wealth and power. By any change in the social machinery, no amount of knowledge or science will be of any avail unless we can curb the bad impulse. Here's what she's saying. I dare you. I double dare you. I triple, triple dog? Is it triple dog? Triple, double dog dare you. Go ahead and build it. Go ahead and form and fashion it. And it will fail for the sole reason that it is built, controlled, governed by man. And they are prone to bad impulses. It is not a problem of structure as far as justice. It is a problem of sin. And you think that church was not important in giving people a different way to live. We don't want God to control anything. So we try to separate and assign ownership 
and domain to all aspects of life. So religion, religion is personal. It is this inward piety. Nothing to do with social obligations or responsibility. And justice, justice is a fragmented term. And usually we define it economically, politically, and also in judicial terms so we can escape the call to do justice in our everyday life. So people are trying to delimit and to define justice so they can get rid of doing it over and over and over again. And so, do you remember? Is the question in the text, do you remember your days in slavery? Do you remember the journey from Shittim to Gilgal? What did that teach you about your God and his justice and his fairness? And I'm pretty sure if I were to survey some of the words you wrote, if you wrote on your scripts or even thought in your mind, as soon as we said justice, your mind shot to critical race theory and you know, wokeness. I don't need to be woke. I've been awake since I've been baptized into Christ. Yes. But we keep the conversation in the realm of volatility. And I understand that. Because no one agrees in that realm. There is endless debate. There is no consensus. And thus, there is no action. That is not biblical justice. Before you had critical race theory, before you had social justice coined, God was all about justice. And here's how he says it. You already know. I have shown you. This is not a pop quiz or a call for a fresh definition. He says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. These are not three things. It's just one. Because if you're walking with God, you would love mercy because you have experienced the mercy of God upon your life. And if you've experienced the mercy of God upon your life, you would want to act justly to every other image bearer of God. So it's not three things. It's actually one. How do we as Christians live a just life? Doing biblical justice is a posture. It's a way of worshiping. It's recognizing that when every other major deity was aloof and separated from mankind, and all concerned about riches and glory, you had the God of the universe revealed himself as the God of the oppressed, as the God of the immigrant, the Ger, the G-E-R, in the Old Testament, the sojourner, the wanderer, the God of orphans who have no power, the God of uh, widows, the, the God of the oppressed. Nowhere in ancient literature do you have any type of so-called God caring for the downtrodden. And so, God is a God of justice. And if he's a God of justice, the people that purport to follow him should also be concerned with justice. And by justice, I mean filling God's earth with his glory, by offering worship that reflects the justice he calls for. You can't worship God without being just. There is no way because he's a just God. And so Tim Keller would say, justice is not charity but advocacy. Not token charity that is detached or at arm's length, but a genuine attempt to welcome and bless the image of God in others. So church folks don't need to control the White House. They just need to control this house. And you and I know very well 
how easy it is to control this house. I'm not going to keep you long this morning. I want to fast forward to a very practical end. But I want to establish in your minds and in the text that these people are coming and it, the text says that they are bowing. That's a worship posture. Because some folks are going to say, well, you know, I don't know this thing about justice and worship. It doesn't make any sense. Go back and read the text. And take your interlinear and take whatever, you know, resources you have. And then you can call me. I'm here every week. Come speak to me. Because your justice is also your worship. So they are bowing down to worship and saying, hey, all right, what does this look like? What does our piety look like? Do you want us to sacrifice rams, calves, even our kids? Remember Abraham last week? Yeah? And Isaac? Yeah? Yes. And he says to them, you're asking me how to give proper worship? You're asking me how to do proper oblations? He says, um, this is an indictment, by the way. This is an indictment, so stay with me. He says, you already know. Oh, what the? You already know? You don't really get that in many places and many spaces. Justice, well, we don't know what it is. It, we, we can't define it. We can't hold it. It's, and God says, hey, don't play those games. Remember where you were. And no one was coming for you. And I could have left it and said, it's not my business. But I was concerned about fairness. So I took you out of that situation. I provided for you. And then you started to act all brand new like you forgot where you came from. You already know. You've seen justice. Now you just need to go out and act justly, love mercy, and walk with your God. You already know. This is not a debate or a discussion or let's have sessions to discuss what justice really is and what it looks like in our world. You already know. Because you get to decide. As a person who has encountered the just God. And so when do I stop? Uh, when we're um, out of Egypt? Uh, when we regain power and we're in control? When the skin color of the object is, 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 is different, it doesn't match up to what we're supposed to respond to. When Title 42 ends, if you're asking those kinds of questions, then you've already stopped worshiping. Because you already know how to worship, he says. If you're asking those types of questions, where's the boundary? Where's the limit? What is too much? What is too little? He says, you already know. This is not a sermon to tell you what you want to do. As a person redeemed by a just God, you already know how to exact justice. Yes. So, you should be asking, where do I begin? Do you know you can begin as you're sitting there this morning? Justice is very practical. And this is, I'm going to be ending on this note. Uh, on Friday evening, I was blessed to attend a ceremony, a sports award ceremony. And um, this long-time educator stood up and he said, you know, every couple of days, you know, I get to volunteer at um, uh, lunchtime, the cafeteria time, right, for the kids. Um, and I'm supervising, I'm talking to everyone, I'm chopping it up. But every now and then... Um, I see like a, a piece of paper on the ground. And I ask a kid, hey, could you please pick that up? And he says, 99.9% .9 of the time. You know what the response is? It's not mine. I thought we were talking about justice. We are, just hold on a sec. It's not mine. It's not my responsibility. Well, those people in Egypt, I didn't put them there. I'm not the one exacting the torture. I'm just going to leave them there. Now, and then you get to Romans, and then we read that while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for the, the righteous and the good. No, he died for the ungodly. 
Is that just? Is that fair? It is because justice is mixed with mercy. If we got what we all deserved, this place wouldn't even be a place. It would be empty. But he's the just God. Because he mixes it with, it with... Yes, I know, I know, I'm almost done. <laughs> he puts it in with mercy. And he says, Walk this way. Talk this way. Walk with your God. Do like your God does. Justice is very simple. And if we cannot be trusted to do the simple things, we won't do the big things. So you go to the bathroom, use the bathroom, flush it. Now some people forget, I understand that. But do you know that somebody else is coming in after you? You use a piece of paper, you just throw it down. I was coming down um, Northwest Highway the other day, and this kid, you know, he, I, he, I'm pretty sure he bought a piece of pizza at 7-Eleven because I saw the box, and he was walking, and as he finished it, he just flung the box in the air, and it landed on the ground. We are alienated from our world and from each other. We act for self-preservation. And so, that piece of paper is not my responsibility. I am not picking it up because I did not put it there. Justice. Are our doors set up to welcome everybody? If you can walk up straight or if you're in a wheelchair, do we have handicap accessibility? How do we treat the bodies of people here? Those with what we call autism or those that are so-called normal? Do we make fun of them? Do you know what I'm saying? Whenever you welcome a new kid, Is it one click here, one click then, and they have to choose? How do you use your social media? What do you talk about people? How do you welcome the image of God, somebody else? That is justice. And the teenager doesn't run away from that. The, the, the middle ager doesn't run away from that. And the more mature member does not run away from that. We all, every single day, have opportunities to exact justice to images of God that flood our environment. Many times we act egocentric, we act selfish, because we don't know who God is. Even in church, you cannot know who God is sometimes. Who is God? God is a just God. God is a loving God. And for his disciples, he says, make your life reflect the same. I'm in traffic, and somebody's speeding towards that light. They won't let me in. Is there a part of God by that light? No. But that's how we are raised. I'm first. And you don't get to come in front of me. I am going to speed up just so that you cannot be in front of me. And there's no prize. At the end of this proverbial rainbow, it is so simple. It is so small. But I'm telling you, if we cannot do the small things, and you see all the reflections of people that are unredeemed and are not living according to justice all around, not just in traffic, but in the, in, in the grocery store and at schools and at homes, you say, thank you for that meal. You know, you go in and let somebody go in first. Honor the image of God in somebody else. And so before we come in and talk about government reform and what the government should be doing and what we want to see and how to vote, which are all good and proper, I want to start with you and me. How does justice look like in your life? How does justice look like in my life? How am I tainting or Blessing, the image of God in somebody else. God says, I'm not required from the animals, but from the humans too. And this is not a debate, because I've shown you, O mortal. I've shown you all through history. I keep on showing you every day. And for you to turn your back and say, well, I don't know what justice is, and I can't worship by living justly. You don't read 
You don't know God. Don't know God. I want to know God. I want to know this God. Somebody handed me a note last week, one of my mentors, and um, he mentioned that some of my slides, when I have my slides, folks from the back can't really read. So you know what I did? I was like, you know what? I want to do justice to those folks. Everyone doesn't have 20-20 vision. I don't got it. That's so when I make my slides, I am thinking of the people in the back. Because I want you to be able to read and follow with me as well. Oh, I don't know. You just gotta keep up. That's not justice. Do the small things. You wonder about changing your world? Remember what our elders said last week, or week before last, after the school shootings? We're not depending on parliament. Well, we don't have parliament. We call it Congress, right? We're depending on each other. Trying to do the next faithful thing to somebody that is close in your proximity so that you might change a life, so that you might affect a life. And so as I'm done, practically everyday decisions to do justice lays in your lap. As soon as you wake up from those benches, you have opportunity. Flush them toilets, man. Pick up the papers. Say thank you. Honor the person in front of you. Don't make memes or jokes about them. Honor them. Because God is living within them. They are image bearers of God. And the last time, some folks were scared out of their minds when they were told, you have taken not just the image of God, but the express image. And you've crucified him. They said, what should we do? Yeah, you read it. What should we do? He's asking the same thing of us today. You meet people every day. Students meet students. Grown-ups meet grown-ups. How do you treat them? How do you treat them? How do you make way for the next person coming before you, or after you, rather? It affects the environment. It affects our spaces. It affects our emotions, it affects our relationships, and it affects our God. So he has shown you a motto. Act justly. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. Can you all stand, please. If you've never heard of his God, I mean, he's, he's always there. And we can help you get in contact with him today. We have water and word. You can be a Christian today. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Be immersed. That's it. Well, that's not it, but I mean, you get the point. And if you've had a warped idea of justice and you've listened to too much Fox News and CNN or whatever you listen to, then I want you to go back and read Micah. Matter of fact, read the 8th century prophets. Read Micah. Read Amos. Read Hosea. Read Isaiah from the 8th to the 6th century and understand what justice is. Because before you had those volatile subjects being pumped through our tubes, and through the media, and through our literature, God said, man, justice is what I do all day long. And you know what it is. So go ahead and do it. Don't convolute it. Don't make it so confusing that people don't know what to do. You know what it is. So this morning, start by just going out and doing it. Have justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly with your God. Father, go before us as we seek to be more just in our relationships, more just as we recognize you have always been a just God to us. Help us to reflect that light. In the name of Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. We are promises, times is the word.
Just uh, wanted to bring up two quick reminders. We have Safe Place training in the uh, family library on the children's hall right now, right after service. And then if you are a, a parent of a child uh, finishing second grade through fifth grade and have any interest at all in Camp Goddard, which we hope you do, because it's a great camp for them, there is a parents meeting right after class. They'll be in the fourth grade classroom. Thank you. Diana Garcia, if you are here today, you have lost something that you probably want back. So see me. I'll be up here. Thank you. All right, one more announcement before we close. There has been this awesome event that's been getting put together for a few weeks. It's called the Hands and Feet Volunteer Fair. It's going to be downstairs in the team center. Um, it's going to have a bunch of local nonprofits, uh, and it's come and go during class. So if you want to go and see what some of those nonprofits have to offer and just learn more about them, please be sure to visit it down the teen center. If you're a visitor and that interests you, you don't know where the teen center is, I point again to the welcome centers on the left and the right. So as we close out, remember, please join us for class this morning and have a wonderful week. You are dismissed.